Hello guys, today I want to talk about The Odyssey by Homer because I finally read it in March and absolutely fell in love with this book and I think that there are many people who want to dive into the Odyssey, who want to read it, but who are really intimidated by it. And therefore, I thought I would give you some tips on how to tackle this tome. First of all, I think you need to understand that the Odyssey is an epic poem. It was written and conceived in verse. However, nowadays there are different translations of this poem, some of which have been translated into prose. So I think the first big question that you have to ask yourself is, do you want to read a verse version of the Odyssey or a prose version? And I would always say go with the verse version. I've been down a Reddit rabbit hole and that seems to be the general consensus that the verse translations are usually much sharper and better and just more exciting than the ones in prose. And this translation that I read by Robert Fagels was also in verse and I absolutely loved it. So personally, I know that a lot of people are very scared or a little bit afraid or intimidated by reading poetry. However, with tales like these, it is a very different feeling and it was conceived that way and it makes a lot of sense for the way in which these tales are told because they have a certain aspect of orality to them and so the prose versions do not manage to convey that feeling of oral literature as well as the verse versions do so i would always say go with a verse version the second question of course is then which translation to pick because there are so many but i personally always knew that i would go with the robert fagel's translation mainly because i wanted to read the odyssey in the penguin deluxe edition, which is maybe not the best reasoning, but it really worked out for me because Fagels has a very modern, like this translation is from the 90s, from the mid 90s. So it is a very modern language, very fresh. There's not a lot of words that you have to look up or anything like that. It really flows quite nicely and you can just read it and understand it. And I loved it to death. I thought that this translation was so expertly done. I of course cannot judge the accuracy myself because I don't speak ancient Greek but Fagels has been praised ever since his translations of the Odyssey and the Iliad which he also translated came out so this is a very well respected very well established translation and from my personal experience I can really recommend it but I want to mention two other translations in English that are very popular nowadays one is the Lattimore translation which has a lot of fans, is very widely read as well. And then there has been a new translation quite recently, I think it was in 2018, that Emily Wilson translated this epic. And she is, I think, the first woman to ever do so. And so this translation has gotten a lot of buzz because I think she has tried to translate the Odyssey with a bit more of a feminist approach because of course, like I read in here as well in the introduction, translating a text from ancient Greek is a uh, very hard and it's not so clear maybe how it would be if you wanted to translate a, I don't know, a French contemporary text to English or so. So there are many words that can have different meanings and many things that you can read differently. And I heard that Emily Wilson went down a very specific path in terms of her translation, so that might be interesting to you. My third tip would be to manage your expectations, because I don't know if it's just me, but I had a lot of misconceptions, or at least like preconceptions about the Odyssey that turned out to be completely false, and I think I went into this book initially with the wrong expectations, because to me, when I thought of the Odyssey, I thought that this was going to be like a 20 year odyssey so kind of a adventurous journey of Odysseus trying to reach his home that is kind of what I thought I generally and I don't know why but I thought that Odysseus was at sea for 20 years and 
you know, battling the Cyclops and sailing past the Sirens and stranding on Cersei's island and having his men turn it, turned into pigs. So I feel like all of these very iconic scenes from the Odyssey that probably most of you also associate with this tale actually only make up a six of this whole entire story because the Odyssey is split into 24 books or chapters and only four of those, so books 9 to 12, are actually Odysseus's period at sea where he has all of these fun adventures and the rest, the other 20 books, are completely different. For example, the first four books of the Odyssey do not focus on Odysseus at all. He's not a part of it. They focus on his son, Telemachus, when he is grown up, when Odysseus has been gone from home for, for 19 years and the situation at, in Ithaca has become very tense because there are suitors who are now wanting to become Penelope's new husband because everyone agrees that Odysseus is dead because the Trojan War has been over for nine years and the man hasn't come home yet and so it is Penelope's duty as a woman to remarry if her husband is presumed dead and Telemachus, Odysseus's son, who was a babe when Odysseus first set sail to fight in the Trojan War, is now grown up, but he is without guidance because his father isn't there, so he doesn't really know how to stand off against the suitors who are harassing his mother, who are eating all of the food, who are really taking everything from Odysseus's household and sucking it dry, basically. And then Athena, the goddess who favors Odysseus, comes to Telemachus to guide him and send him on his own little journey to Pylos and Sparta to ask Menelaus and Nestor if they've heard anything of Odysseus because they fought with him in the war. And so you're kind of starting this odyssey with Odysseus' son and you're just like, what is going on here? And then by book 13, Odysseus has already reached Ithaca. So you're like, oh, he's already home. So what is like the second half of this narrative going to be? And it is really his revenge on the suitors of setting things right at home. And so the Odyssey is not really a story of adventure in that way. It is much more a story of homecoming and what homecoming means, what home means and Odysseus setting things right at home. And for me, once I realized this, because I just looked up a timeline then, because I was very confused in the beginning. I was like, what is going on? And the Odyssey is also not told in chronological order. There's many flashbacks and the timeline was very foggy for me. So I just looked it up and I was like, oh, that is very interesting because for me, the second half of this story, Odysseus's revenge in Ithaca, was so much more exciting to me than his adventures at sea. And my favorite chapter, for example, was chapter 22, which is the slaughter of the suitors. It is what Shakespeare tried to do with Titus Andronicus. It is what George R. R. Martin tried to do with his Red Wedding. And it is what is rooted here in Homer. This wonderful slaughter in Odysseus's halls. I loved it. It was exciting, exhilarating. It was brutal. It was bloody. It was gory. It was just a great climax for this story. I loved it a lot. And I don't know if that is a problem, but I had a fun time time reading it. It's really important to kind of manage one's expectations and to go in kind of with the right expectations for this book, which is, yeah, like I said, much more a book of homecoming than it is a book of adventure. My fourth tip in terms of pacing is that I think that if you're a slow reader or if you're very intimidated and you're like, ah, oh, this is going to take me months to read, I personally would suggest reading one book a day. Like I said before, this story is split into 24 books. So if you read a book a day, you are done in 24 days. That is under a month. That is very reasonable. I think if you're a bit more of a faster or a quicker reader, you can try to read two to four books a day and yeah, and just be done quicker. But the Odyssey is not as long as people think. I think the actual Odyssey in and out of itself is only like 400 pages long, 420, that's not that huge. So personally, 
I read it within two weeks and that was the right pacing for me. But I would really say that to not let too much time pass between your readings of this book because it is a very exciting story and once you're really in it and you're sucked in, it makes a lot of sense to just keep going, to just keep reading because it is a story that builds a lot. It is especially the second half. Homer is very good at delayed reunions and building up the suspense and the tension and you just want him and Penelope to reunite and it just does not keep happening and so you keep turning the pages. It is wonderfully, masterfully crafted. It is very exciting. So I would really say that if you have the time to really try to immerse yourself in this story and to keep reading because it will definitely enrich in your reading experience. My fifth point is more in terms of trying to understand the story, trying to find a good analysis and interpretation. So in terms of secondary reading, I would definitely recommend getting an edition that has a long introduction and that has good notes. And that is why I, for example, wanted to have the Penguin Deluxe Classics Edition. This edition was fantastic. The introduction is... 60 pages, almost 70 pages long. It is split into different chapters focusing on different things like the Greek mythology aspect of the Odyssey or Homer as a person. Was Homer just one person or were there multiple persons? Did he conceive the Odyssey orally? So did he speak it to the people? Or did he himself write it down? If so, how was that possible? How was it passed on throughout the centuries? Things like that. It was a fantastic introduction. It also had some maps of ancient Greece in here. And then the thing that was the game changer for me were the notes at the back, which were really, really helpful. I loved them and I referenced them a lot. The, there were very great explanations for what was going on. And one thing that I also found super helpful and I just read through because at the end I just found it so interesting is this pronunciation glossary where literally every single character or name of a city or whatever that pops up in the Odyssey is explained so who that person is or what that city signifies and then also how it is pronounced properly in English that was wonderful so I think it is really important to have a good edition I think in the English language that is not very hard to come by Penguin usually has wonderful editions like this Oxford is also always good with its notes Norton of course as well even though I think that could be probably quite overwhelming because I assume that the Norton Critical Edition of the Odyssey is just ginormous. But yeah, get a good edition of this book. But then of course you can also find other resources online that can help you through this story. And my two other tips are in terms of yeah, other media that you can use to understand the Odyssey. What I personally did is that I listened to two podcasts. I listened to the Close Read podcast. I love Close Reads. I often listen to their episodes when the book that they're talking about interests me. And they did a huge series of the Odyssey. I think it's overall like 13 different podcasts because they went through the book, of course, chrono chronologically. And then there are some episodes which focus on four books. For example, the first episode, which focuses on the whole Telemachia, which is book one to four. But then there are other episodes that only focus on one or two episodes that are a bit more like condensed and diving deep into these books. And I thought that their discussions were wonderful. And I would recommend reading the chapters first for yourself and then afterwards listening to the close reads podcast because they didn't really concern themselves with like summarizing what is really going on they straight went into the analysis and discussion which I loved and found interesting but that's how I would recommend it whereas the other podcast that I listened to in regards to the Odyssey which was the literature and history podcast which is always amazingly researched I would actually recommend or you could at least listen to that before uh, reading the chapters because he only has three episodes on the Odyssey out there and so he talks about eight books per episode and his episodes are much more 
summary. So he goes through what is happening in these books very detailed and then he gives a little bit of insight. But it's not this grand analysis. It is much more of a summary. And I found it very helpful because I realized that I was not that familiar with what is going on in the Odyssey. And so having these very broad summaries for eight books was really good in trying to yeah, manage expectations and knowing what was going to come and then kind of really seeing for yourself how it plays out on the page was wonderful for me. So the Literature and History podcast I would recommend listening to before diving into the book and the Close Reads podcast I would recommend listening afterwards. There are of course also many resources here on YouTube. I watched the little TED ad video on the Odyssey which is a nice little summary as well as the Crash Courses video on the Odyssey but there are of course also many different reviews sometimes even lectures so if you really like using YouTube as a tool then there is many things you can find on our platform here as well in like in terms of helping you understand the Odyssey. My eighth tip is to focus on what's most important to you. If this is your first read of the Odyssey, which was also my first read of the Odyssey, it can be very overwhelming to hear of all of these discussions, sometimes even just like surrounding the text. Like I mentioned earlier, like who was Homer? Did he even exist? Was Homer just one person? Was Homer a man? Was he really blind? Could he write? Or did he, you know, was an oral poet? And did he have some scribes who wrote it down? Or was the Odyssey written down some centuries after he already past but his story has been you know like all of these discussions and then of course also textual discussions of you know trying to find a good analysis of Odysseus as a character because he is the man of many ways the man of twists and turns a complicated man there are many different opinions that you can have of him and his actions and it's very interesting to analyze it all but personally I feel like especially as a first time reader and someone who might be reading it on your own and not uh, at university or something like that. All of these discussions and trying, like wanting to understand everything can be super overwhelming. So I would really say that you have to give yourself a break. You don't have to understand every single reference, everything that's going on here. Focus on what is important to you and you have to figure that out for yourself. I cannot tell you what you should find important here, but I personally focused a lot on the characters because I found the character dyna dynamics in this book very fascinating. I really took the Telemachus at first and then seeing him when Odysseus is in Ithaca after his own little hero's journey, he was a changed character. Found that very interesting because I had a little bit more problems with him as this grown up. And then Odysseus as well, I thought he was a very fascinating character and Penelope too. So that is kind of what I focus more on the different character dynamics, but you can focus on something else. But yeah, don't get intimidated by all of these academic discussions surrounding this text. You don't need all of them. You know, you can really just focus on what's important to you. My ninth tip is also, but that's just something that I thought was fun. That's a bit more of a very niche um, interest, but I found it very interesting to see how this text influenced modern texts that I had already read. So whenever something seems, seemed oddly familiar to me or something like that, I really pondered on that and was just like, wow, that's crazy because this text is so old, right? It's now over 2,800 years old. I found it very interesting how many of the tropes that are part of the Odyssey are found in modern fantasy today. Like I said before, there were so many aspects of A Song of Ice and Fire by George R. R. Martin that I already found in the Odyssey. I was shook and I think that will probably even become more apparent in the Iliad, which I'm going to read sometime in the future. I also thought that Odysseus was very similar to Quoth of the King Killer Chronicles by Patrick Rothfuss, more in terms of narration, because the Odyssey, similarly to The Name of the Wind and Wise Men's Fear, is not narrated by like one narrator just telling you the story. You have layers upon layers of Odysseus telling his own story, and then Odysseus being an unreliable narrator. So Odysseus, for example, all of his adventures that I've mentioned before with the Cyclops and the Sirens and Circe and the Lestragonians and the Lotus Eaters and 
and all of that, Odysseus tells these tales to the Phaeacians or the Phaeacians, I have forgotten how to pronounce them, to kind of rouse their hearts and make them give him a ship so that he can finally sail to Ithaca. So he wants to win their favor by telling these tales. So the likelihood of him maybe making things up or making himself seem larger than life, bigger than he actually is, is of course there. And that is a narrative device that Patrick Rothfuss uses very skillfully in the King Killer Chronicles as well, with Quoth also being a man of many ways and you don't really know his pure intentions or if his intentions are even pure in the first place because Quoth is telling his own life story and you're kind of like, honey, I have the suspicion that you're actually the villain of this tale. And I found that very interesting and also Dante I read The Divine Comedy last year, absolutely loved it. And I found it very interesting because when Odysseus is in Hades, you can definitely see, even though Dante hasn't read or couldn't have read the Odyssey because when he was alive, there was no translation out there that he could read. At least that's how I understood it. But when you um, read this chapter of Odysseus in Hades and how he speaks to the penitent souls there, it is very reminiscent of the Divine Comedy. And it, it was just very interesting for me, at least seeing all of these influences and pondering how all of literature is kind of connected to each other. I truly believe in intertextuality. I really, yeah, I don't know. I feel like there's just like this one big story that humanity wants to tell and everything is just connected to each other. And I find that beautiful. My last tip is kind of in terms of uh, judging this book, how useful it is to apply a very modern viewpoint to this story, because I feel like sometimes that can actually cloud your vision and take the purpose or the sense out of the reading experience. And for that, I mean that I've seen some reviews of people criticizing this book or saying that they didn't enjoy it because it is so sexist and they hated how Penelope was so like adjacent to Odysseus that she was basically this woman who was left what for 20 years because her husband took 20 years to return from the war or like to go to war and then return. And she kind of put her life on hold for that period. And, you know, it is very interesting because there are of course many instances in this story where from a modern viewpoint, you would say, honey, you are an asshole. When Odysseus slaughters the suitors, you know, I was rooting for him, but when he orders the hanging of the maids who slept with the suitors, that from a modern point of view is a no-go. Like that is, I um, was like, honey, these maids were most likely raped by these suitors. And Odysseus has a point of view of wanting to purify his household now. And that is why the maids have to die and have to be hanged for their sin. And of course you can say, Eo, I hate it. And I feel like it's totally valid to say that, but I feel like then as a next step, this is not why you should then dismiss this narrative as a whole and be like, ugh, that's just dated and we hate it here. And it's just, you know, it's just harmful or whatever. I feel like that is not the right approach. I feel like it's very interesting to have these discussions. Like I've mentioned before, Emily Wilson trying to have this more feminist approach. It is always interesting to apply a feminist analysis to a text, but I still think that it's very important to also let the text stand then for itself and still like appreciate the brilliant moments in text and also its influence over time. So I feel like with the Odyssey, at least for me, you kind of have to really let yourself into the narrative and into the values of the time. So when Homer presents Odysseus as a hero, as this upright man, soldier, this cunning person, you can of course have your own opinion be like, yeah, I don't know, I think he's kind of an asshole, but you have to kind of let, I don't really know how to explain it. Like you cannot really fault the other characters in the text for also treating him as a hero or Odysseus thinking of himself as a hero. You have to take that as it is because that was the worldview back then. And a man who acted like Odysseus was what you wanted to be, what you wanted to strive for. And you have to kind of let that breathe and stand for itself. And for me, that dual perspective of 
you know, letting the text be the text, but then sometimes also, you know, coming in with my bit more like modern views. That was very fun for me. And so for me overall, I have a huge appreciation for the Odyssey and I love this book a lot. And I think it is brilliant. And, um, yeah, I would really say don't try to let our own conceptions of what good people are stand in the way of enjoying this very old tax. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and that you will read the Odyssey, hopefully in a verse version, not a prose version. And I wish you the best of fun with it because it is a brilliant tax that I would highly, highly recommend more people to read. And I will see you in my next video. Bye.